Now the first day of witness testimony before the U.S. House Committee investigating campaign fundraising. Last Thursday, Government Reform and Oversight Committee Chairman Dan Burton called three witnesses who are familiar with Democratic Party contributor Charlie Tree. They testified after a short period of opening statements. However, they chose to enforce their right that their testimony not be televised, so we left the hearing as soon as they were sworn in. The committee will come to order. Would the television cameras kind of recede a little bit? And uh, when we get through with our opening statements at the request of the counsel for the witnesses, uh, we will ask the TV cameras to leave the room. Good morning. A quorum being president, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Before the distinguished ranking member and I deliver our opening statements, the committee must first dispose of some procedural issues. I ask unanimous consent that members be able to use the depositions of Manlin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wang at today's hearing and ask further unanimous consent that they be made a part of the record. Reserving the right to object, those depositions, Mr. Chairman, will be uh, in their entirety part of the record? Yes, sir. We have no objection. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and committee rule 14 in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided between the majority and minority and without objection so ordered reserving the right to object gentleman reserves the right to object does this mean mr chairman that committee counsel with his questioning will precede members of the committee Yes, sir. For the first hour, we will have committee counsel on each side question for 30 minutes. I'll be glad to you. Uh, the rules have recently been changed in the House of Representatives to provide for an interrogation of a half hour first by the majority and then a half hour by the minority, uh, that the time can be allocated to staff or to members as the chairman sees fit on his side or we see fit uh, uh, on our side. Um, that is correct. Th under the rules, this must be agreed to either by uh, uh, consent for the rank by the ranking member with the chairman or a vote of the committee. Uh, I don't see an objection to what the chairman is requesting. I think this is going to be the first time that the House of Representatives has used this new format for a, a more extensive, extended period of time for interrogation, um, we'll, we'll try it out. Continuing my right to reserve, uh, I will not object. However, I think it is a very bad procedure. It is analogous in political campaigns of having a battle of advertising agencies <laughs> rather than candidates themselves. I think members of this committee should conduct their own questioning. That is why we have been sent here by our respective constituencies and to turn this very important function over to uh, our staff, I think, is uh, uh, less than ideal procedure, but I withdraw my objection. Without objection, so ordered. I further ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes for the first panel, equally divided between the majority and the minority. And there has been agreement reached between myself and uh, uh, the Ranking Member, Mr. Waxman, that we will proceed uh, under uh, 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 an equation or a situation where there will be 10 minutes given to the majority side, then 10 minutes to the minority, and so on until the 60 minutes is exhausted. Is there objection? Hearing none, so order. I have a motion at the desk, and the clerk will report. Excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. On October 1, 1997, the committee received a letter addressed from Charles J. Stevens requesting on behalf of his clients, Manlin Fong and Joseph Landon, that the cameras be turned off pursuant to Clause 3F 
two of Rule House 11. Similarly, David Wang's attorney, Michael A. Carvin, sent a, a similar letter on October 8, 1997. Without objection, those letters will be entered into the record. Clause 3F2 of House Rule 11 allows a subpoenaed witness to have the cameras turned off and the microphones used for broadcast turned off. The rules provide that, quote, no witness served with a subpoena by the committee shall be required against his or her will to be photographed at any hearing or to give evidence or testimony while the broadcasting of that hearing by radio or television is being conducted. At the request of any such witness who does not wish to be subjected to radio, television, or still photography coverage, all lenses shall be covered and all microphones used for coverage turned off. While I'm disappointed that this hearing will not be televised, uh, we believe the American people have the right to know what these witnesses have to say. However, Man Lin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wang have asserted their rights under the rule, and the committee is obliged to honor their request. Therefore, at the appropriate time, I will instruct our friends in the media to observe the rule and cover all lenses and shut off all microphones used for coverage. I now yield myself such time as I may consume. Today marks the first day of hearings into illegal foreign fundraising and other violations of law during recent campaigns. We have three witnesses today. These individuals have admitted to making conduit contributions to the Democrat National Committee. Testifying on our first panel will be Manlin Fong, the sister of Charlie Tree. Joining her will be her companion, Joseph Landon. Testifying on our second panel will be David Wang, a businessman from Los Angeles. Our witnesses today are not villains. They are victims. They are ordinary people who were put on the spot by someone they trusted, and they got burned. Ms. Fong, Mr. Landon, and Mr. Wang have given their full cooperation to this committee, and we really appreciate that. We have, they have talked to us voluntarily. Their testimony will help us as we slowly but surely try to put the pieces of this puzzle together. We owe them our thanks for their cooperation. It stands in marked contrast to the cooperation we have received from the White House and the Democrat National Committee. The difficulty this committee has faced with the White House has been deplorable. It is an outrage that the White House has withheld knowledge of the White House coffee videotapes until now. This committee's March 4th subpoena specifically required the production of videotapes seven months ago. At least a half a dozen senior White House aides and the President himself were taped. It is obvious that the President himself and most of his senior staff knew that these tapes existed for a long time. After all, the President was in the tapes. The fact that they have been withheld this entire year borders on obstruction. There are reportedly another 150 tapes of Democrat National Committee events that we still have not received. The record shows more and more that this White House and this President are not eager for the American people to know the whole truth, and the American people have a right to know the facts. Fortunately, today, we have witnesses who have been cooperative and are willing to tell the truth. Ms. Fong and Mr. Landon contributed $35,000 to the DNC in 1996 at Charlie Tree's request. They were promptly reimbursed for each contribution. Our investigators have traced $10,000 of this amount directly back to the Bank of China in Macau. This money was wired to the United States in August 1996. Within 10 days, it was in the hands of the Democrat National Committee. The other $25,000 was repaid in sequentially numbered money orders from, from a bank in New York City. Mr. Wang contributed $5,000 to the Democratic National Committee in August of last year. His friend Daniel Wu also contributed $5,000. Daniel Wu lives in Taiwan. Both contributions were made at the request of John Wong. Both men were paid back with envelopes full of cash given to them by Antonio Pan. We have granted these witnesses immunity from prosecution. This is an extra layer of protection to make sure that these three people can come forward and tell the American people what happened without any fear. It is well known that the Justice Department, as a matter of policy, does not seek to prosecute straw donors. I will quote from a 1994 memo from the director of the Justice Department's election crimes branch. Quote, the Justice Department has a long-standing non-prosecution policy for persons who are used as conduits or straws to disguise another person's illegal contributions, provided that allowing their names to be used by another is the extent of their participation in the scheme, end quote. 
The testimony we are about to receive cannot be dismissed lightly. John Wong and Charlie Tree are both close friends and appointees of the President. John Wong was in the White House over 90 times during the President Clinton's first term. He had numerous meetings with the President. The President personally intervened to help move him from the Commerce Department to the Democrat National Committee. This is the first time in my memory that we have seen evidence of such blatantly illegal activity by a senior National Party official. John Wong's title at the Democrat National Committee was Vice Chairman for Finance. Likewise, Charlie Tree was a close personal friend of the President. Charlie Tree visited the White House nearly 40 times that we know of. In early 1996, the President signed an executive order enlarging a presidential commission on trade so he could appoint Mr. Tree to that commission. It should be disturbing to all of us to receive testimony about illegal and unethical, unethical conduct by such close associates to the President of the United States. An important figure that is going to emerge during this hearing is a man named Antonio Pan. Mr. Pan is a rather mysterious figure who had ties to Charlie Tree, the Lippo Group, and John Wong. He was in the White House eight times in 1995 and 1996. He was apparently the bag man in both the transactions involving Manlin Fong and David Wang. It will become clear through documents and testimony that he was handling large amounts of cash. Antonio Pan's involvement here raises a number of questions. Whose bidding was he doing? Charlie Trees, John Wong's, the Lippo Group? Were they all collaborating? Where did the cash come from? A number of the transactions we are going to talk about today involved cash, large amounts of cash. If we are going to trace the origins of this money, we are going to have to talk to the people who handled that cash. Charlie Tree has left the country. I don't think he's planning on coming back. The last we heard, he was in Shanghai. John Wong has taken the fifth. Antonio Pan has left the country. According to our most recent information, we believe that he's either in Hong Kong or New Zealand. This is a perfect case study in the obstacles that this committee has faced in trying to root out the truth about the illegal foreign money that was flowing to the DNC. The obstacles have been many. More than 60 people have either taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country to avoid revealing their role in this scandal. Next week, the President will be meeting with the President Jean Zemin of the People's Republic of China. If he wants to get all of the facts laid out on the table, he should insist that the Chinese government send Charlie Tree back to the United States so we can question him. The American people have an absolute right to know what Charlie Tree did and what senior government officials asked him to do. Finally, today's hearing is going to focus much needed attention on the DNC's program of identifying and returning illegal contributions. It appears that the DNC's highly touted audit by Ernst & Young was error prone and is completely unreliable. This is a subject that we are likely to return to in future hearings. I once again want to thank our witnesses for their cooperation. This has been a tense and nervous couple of weeks for them and we understand that. This hearing room is probably the last place that you want to be today, but we are going to try to make this as easy as possible for all of you. I now recognize our ranking member, Mr. Waxman, for his comments. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. After nearly a year of investigating and $3 million having been spent, we're hearing from our first witnesses about the 1996 elections. The focus of this hearing is on conduit payments. Conduit payments are, of course, illegal. Unfortunately, they've also become much too common. In Senator Dole's campaign, for instance, both Simon Fireman and Empire Landfill have admitted to pervasive conduit schemes and directed $149,000 in the illegal donations to the Dole campaign. In fact, today's Washington Post has the headline, Firm to Pay $8 Million Fine for Illegal Campaign Gifts. Moreover, as the chart on the screen indicates, the Federal Elections Commission is currently investigating 27 conduit payments involving 214 individuals. The FEC has closed 21 cases involving 108 individuals, 
and levied $335,000 in fines. The FEC also closed without action 20 cases involving 246 respondents under their enforcement priority system. All these cases are for the 1992, 1994, and 1996 election cycles. Our hearings would have value if they at least add to the knowledge gained already in Senator Thompson's hearings. So it is useful to review briefly the July 29 Senate hearing that focused on Charlie presidential Creed's appointment in April of uh, 1996. So the committee will hear today from Mr. Jerry Campaign, an agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and it will later hear from two witnesses to whom it is uh, granted uh, immunity uh, for the <coughs> from uh, the use of their testimony in any criminal prosecutions against them. Uh, Senator Glenn, do you have an opening statement? I know this. Statement. All right, Mr. Campaign, will you please stand and raise your right hand? That was an excerpt from Senator Thompson's hearing and part of his opening statement. Uh, at that hearing, he had three witnesses testify. The first, Jerry Campaign, who was an FBI agent detailed to the Senate. He led the Senate conduit investigation and used the chart now on the screen, if we could have that chart put on the screen, to show how Charlie Tree and Eng Lap Sang, also known as Mr. Wu, arranged conduit payments. And I want to point out that these conduit payments were for a February 1996 fundraiser at the Hay Adams Hotel, which is the same fundraiser that Manlin Fong and Joseph Landon contributed to. Also hearing, also testifying at the Senate hearing were Yu Chu and uh, Xi Ping Wang, whose names are on the charts. They received immunity from the Senate and testified that they made contributions and were subsequently reimbursed by Charlie Tree and Eng Lab Sang. In my view, the Senate hearing conclusively demonstrated that Mr. Tree and Eng Lap Sang asked Yu Chu and Xi Ping Wang to make conduit contributions. The depositions of Manlin Fong and Joseph Landon seem to indicate that they had an identical experience. But there is nothing in their deposition that adds to the knowledge to what Senator Thompson uncovered in his July 29 hearing. Instead of bringing them here from California, we could have achieved the same result simply by replaying not just that opening from Senator Thompson's hearing, but the whole hearing itself. Now, we have a third witness today, but before addressing his testimony, I want to make a brief comment to my Democratic colleagues. As a senior Democrat on this committee, I have a special responsibility to make sure our side has all the necessary information in making decisions. In retrospect, I believe I made a serious mistake in not adequately questioning the information Chairman Burton gave to us regarding David Wang and in agreeing to his recommendation to approve immunity. When the matter was before us, I was influenced most by the fact that Mr. Wang seemed to be an innocent victim in a conduit scheme, and that he made statements to committee investigators without an attorney present and with no understanding of the legal consequences that he faced. But I was also perhaps too sensitive to the fact that if the Democrats opposed immunity, we would be accused of being partisan. I will not make that mistake again. It is now clear that David Wang never should have received immunity. He has repeatedly misled this committee and Chairman Burton and his staff and our staff. And we have uh, f uh, failed to ensure that his representations were truthful. The essence of his testimony, the part the chairman, the Republican chief counsel, and other committee members have been citing and the press has been reporting appeared to be a fiction. I personally questioned Mr. Wang during his deposition on Monday, and he testified that John Wong called him on the morning of August 16th. According to Mr. Wang's testimony, one hour later, 
John Wong then arrived at Mr. Wang's Los Angeles office. Mr. Wang also testified that at that time, John Wong asked for and immediately received Mr. Wang's contribution to the Clinton campaign. The truth, however, is that this never happened. John Wong did not meet with David Wang on August 16. In the last three days, the Democratic staff has thoroughly investigated this matter. Later this morning, I will enter into the record hotel bills, receipts, photographs, news stories, and sworn affidavits that prove jo that John Wong was in New York on August 16. It was impossible for him to have met with Mr. Wang. Now, it's bad enough that we have approved immunity for false testimony. But even worse is that in the course of his deposition, Mr. Wang disclosed other criminal acts, or potential criminal acts, that are far more serious than his conduit contribution. But because he provided that information in response to a question Republican counsel Dick Bennett asked, he is, now has immunity for that crime as well. We have blundered into giving Mr. Wang immunity for immigration and tax fraud and received only false statements in return. At the outset, I said our hearings will only have value if we add to what Senator Thompson has learned. But that presupposes that we do no harm. Today, we do harm. We have made a careless and irresponsible decision on immunity. We cannot take the representations Chairman Burton gives us at face value, and I regret that we didn't initiate our own democratic investigation of Mr. Wang earlier. That is another mistake we won't make again. In a year of embarrassments, this is the most damaging one to our committee. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. I would just like to say to the ranking member that uh, while immunity was granted, uh, there is no immunity for perjury before this committee, and all witnesses will be sworn, as the ranking member knows. With that, uh, in accordance with what I uh, previously stated in the rule, uh, we will ask the cameras to be shut off, to be uh, covered, and the microphones to be covered so that we can uh, proceed with the... Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, yes. In light of the fact that the most serious witness before us is Mr. Wang, I would request that we put him on first. Uh, we, we already have the schedule, and the chair has... There's no reason why that schedule couldn't be changed. He is the, he is the witness that, from whom we are going to learn something today. And we may have learned that, uh, to our regret, uh, we're out giving immunity inappropriately. Mr. Let's uh, put him on first. Mr. Waxman, the gentleman...